Welcome back to the Kingdom Hearts 4 World Watch. I say welcome back because this is part 3, which I've actually hinted at in the title. Parts 1 and 2 cover the Disney animated canon and Pixar respectively, so I'd suggest checking those out first. Today, we're covering the big, hyper-realistic, and sometimes needlessly adapted from a cartoon elephant in the room, the Disney live-action properties. As you're probably aware, Kingdom Hearts does have a history of exploring live-action films for its worlds, specifically the Pirates of the Caribbean and Tron franchises, starting with Kingdom Hearts 2 and continuing in Dream Drop Distance and KH3. Of course, a lot has gone down in the 17 years since KH2 released, and the Disney umbrella has widened. A franchise like Pirates, seeming big and grand in 2005, is a shrinking violet compared to some of the other juggernauts Disney now has under its belt. And given how much more bloated Disney's live-action catalog has become in the past decade or so, whether by creation or acquisition, coupled with KH's newfound interest in things that exist in a more realistic unreality, I would say that KH4 is the most ripe game for live-action inclusion we've ever and possibly will ever see. To me, there is a non-zero chance that every world Sora explores in KH4 could be live-action or live-action adjacent. At bare minimum, I think he'll be visiting at least one, and the truth likely lies somewhere in the middle. So, we're gonna look at what you want to see the most and what you think is most likely, and I'll give my thoughts along the way. Now, as I referenced, the sheer amount of stuff that can be described as a live-action Disney property is overwhelming, so the survey I sent out is by no means comprehensive. A decent amount of stuff was suggested and requested by people around me as I was in the process of building the survey. There's probably stuff that has no real business being on here, and stuff that I forgot. For the latter, feel free to let me know, and I'll consider throwing it into a future survey of miscellaneous stuff that we may do at a later date. For the former, there are weird things on here, stuff that 90% of people watching probably hadn't heard of, including myself prior to starting this project, but I included for the sake of consistency, and we'll get to that later. I should also say, this episode will be a bit structurally different when compared to the first two episodes, in part due to the amount of films being covered, but also because it makes more sense to me to talk more broadly about certain types of movies as opposed to really diving into each one individually. For example, every live-action remake of an animated Disney movie was included in this survey, but I don't really see the value in designating a ton of time to each and every one. Rather, I think I'll be talking more generally about the chunk of remake films and the concept of them being used in Cage 4 as opposed to really getting into the weeds of how well I think live-action Cinderella would work, and then doing the same for Dumbo, Lady and the Tramp, etc. I'll still give everything a score and show you how the audience rated everything, but it would feel like padding to me if I were to give each movie a segment and find new ways to reiterate the same basic idea I have concerning films of that type. Before getting into the movies themselves, a general thought. I think with these films, especially the newer ones, there's a lot more legal and financial stuff to consider when compared to pretty much everything we discussed in parts 1 and 2. I'm not an expert on copyright law or how exactly actors' likenesses can be used in these games, for how long, and for how much. If you recall, Melody of Memory glossed over characters from Pirates and Tron among animated properties with more complex legal situations than things like The Lion King or Frozen. Of course, just one year prior, KH3 featured the Caribbean, including realistic depictions of real-life actors. So I think this is less a conversation about being unable to acquire the right or license to depict an actor's likeness, and more so about picking and choosing which spots are worth spending the money on. And I love Mel Mem, but I could understand only having so much money allocated to a more minor title, whereas maybe some bigger spending is possible for major titles like 3 and 4. Is there enough money to go around to have, say, Scarlett Johansson, Chris Evans, Mark Hamill, Harrison Ford, and others all depicted in the same game? I have no earthly idea. Like I said, I don't know the ins and outs of how this stuff works, and I'm sure a lot of it operates on a case-by-case -case basis. These hypothetical worlds could also take the avenue of depicting characters in a more generic or original way, or simply staying away from names that might be a bit too costly. That is, if they even are costly, because maybe in some cases a movie deal might also give a production company the ability to use an actor's likeness for whatever they want without extra cost for a set amount of time. And if that extends to Square Enix developing a video game using said likeness, I do not know. For the sake of brevity and to be honest, fun, I'm not going to factor this stuff into my discussion moving forward, but I just wanted to mention it up top to show that I am aware of, but not fluent in, the business side of things when it comes to these matters. So let's get into the first real segment here, which I'm dubbing Attraction Flow. Why is that, you ask? Well, you may know how the aforementioned Pirates of the Caribbean series actually originates from the Dark Ride attraction at Disneyland. So since Pirates found its way into Kingdom Hearts, it stands to reason that any other Disney theme park attractions that spawned movie adaptations should also have a shot at making it into KH. And when I say stands to reason, I mean the reasoning of an insane person. Well, let's list our candidates here before we toss out absolutely everything. 
In chronological order, we have 1997's made-for-TV Tower of Terror based on the Twilight Zone Tower of Terror at Disney's Hollywood Studios. Next, 2000's Mission to Mars based on the attraction of the same name at Disneyland. Next, unfortunately, is 2002's The Country Bears based on the Disney World attraction Country Bear Jamboree. Then we've got 2003's The Haunted Mansion based on the Disneyland ride of the same name. I'm also grouping in 2015's Tomorrowland, which is more so inspired by one of the themed areas in Disneyland as opposed to one single attraction, but we'll count it. And lastly, the newest one, 2021's Jungle Cruise, again based on the ride of the same name at Disneyland. Oh boy, lots to unpack here. Well, first of all, the premise of including all of these just because pirates made the jump to cage was a slightly facetious premise from the jump, but again, going for some degree of consistency here. Nothing I just listed comes close to even sniffing the level of success and presence in our cultural consciousness that pirates has seen, even if we're only talking about the Curse of the Black Pearl. Still, some of these are more worth having a serious conversation about than others. Let's start with some of those less serious ones, like Mission to Mars, a film that had many survey takers asking, what? It's also the only movie in this bunch based on a ride that doesn't exist anymore and hasn't since 1993. If you'd believe it, it's about a team of astronauts going to Mars. Now, I don't know if you've heard, but we actually have a couple of other space-based movies in consideration already, so we'll stop wasting our time on this. That'll be two one scores for me. The audience gave it a want score of 2.11, 35th out of 41 properties, and a 1.44 for prediction, putting it at 40th out of 41. Next, Tower of Terror, which isn't at the bottom of this discussion barrel for the sole reason of its ride still existing. It's also the only television film we're covering today, save for one much more notable exception later on. This is, again, not worth more than a minute. I would think some kind of attraction attack of Sora rocketing up and down on a cosmic Tower of Terror light projection is infinitely more likely than a whole world made up of the hotel itself with a Kirsten Dunst party member. Also, it seems like nobody who took the survey knew what this was, and neither did I before this project. A 1 for prediction and a 1.5 for want. I like the ride. The audience was just slightly kinder to this over Mission to Mars, with a 2.88 want score, 29th overall, and a 1.66 prediction score, 38th overall. Shockingly not at the bottom of the list for me within this group of attraction films is the profoundly unattractive film that is The Country Bears. God, this thing bothered me when I first saw the commercials for it as a kid, and it bothered me just now when I forced myself through the first 20 minutes of it, and god damn it, not a second more than that, thank you so much. There is just no way. What a putrid, nasty little thing. The one potentially good thing to come out of a Country Bears world is a brief throwaway joke about how the main kid bear sounds just like Sora because they're both voiced by HJO. I have never written a more useless paragraph than this one. Two more one scores for me, with the audience giving it a 2.37, 33rd overall, and between our first two attraction films. But for prediction, it was absolute rock bottom, with a 1.43, the least likely film to appear as far as the audience is concerned. I do find this second half of our attraction films more worthy of discussion, but not by a huge margin. Working newest to oldest for this half, I do think Jungle Cruise is better suited for the formula than anything we've discussed so far, but the vast majority of the movie is rooted in fairly unfantastical environments, and the zanier stuff doesn't really rear its head until late in the runtime. It's more of a traditional adventure than those first three movies, and it's newer, which I think is usually going to be a point in a movie's favor unless we're dealing with something really huge and lasting. But it's also just a pretty run-of-the-mill adventure movie by my estimation, though a whole world set along the Amazon River does have potential. There's also some pretty death-centric vibes to this one, though we do have a handful of better options when it comes to films exploring that stuff. Plus, wouldn't it be weird to have The Rock here and also in the Moana world? I give it a 2 for both scores. The audience was decently higher on it, giving it a want score of 3.33, 24th overall, and a prediction score of 2.97, 14th overall. Tomorrowland takes less inspiration from the park area and more from Walt Disney's general philosophy toward the future. Obviously, the actual Tomorrowland part of the movie would be the more interesting Kingdom Hearts environment, though a large portion of the movie takes place in regular old Earth. It also includes a character riding a Disney ride inside the Disney movie, so how about that for a cinematic self-high-five? Tomorrowland is literally designated as an alternate dimension, and the movie deals with the threat of apocalypse, all stuff unforeign to KH, though I can't say I really see this one at the top of the list when it comes time for Nomura to pick worlds, which I guess he already has, so. It also didn't really do that well, and I'm not sure how many people even recognize or remember it despite it only being 7 years old. A 1 for want and a 1.5 for prediction for me. The audience gave it a 3.17 for its want score, 26th overall, and a 2.23 for its prediction score, 23rd overall. 
I do think the most likely out of all these offerings is the Haunted Mansion, which at the very least beats out Tower of Terror for a world based on a spooky Disney park ride. I don't know if Haunted Mansion is necessarily beloved, but it's left more of a footprint than everything else so far and might hold some nostalgia for some folks. I don't anticipate going back to Halloween Town again, so if we wanted a successor for a spooky world, this isn't the absolute worst pick. Although I do think given the sheer scope of worlds in KH3, a world set in just the grounds of the titular mansion might feel a bit limiting. Once again, this one leans into the death angle the most, if you hadn't guessed, so it's got that going for it, but this mostly smells like cameo or easter egg fodder to me. They're actually releasing a remake of this one next year. The original one is 20, which has me feeling like one of those ghosts. Jared Leto is in the new one, so it's bound to be scarier. I'll give the mansion a 2 for both scores. The audience was pretty high on it, giving it a want score of 4.79 for 9th place overall, and a prediction score of 2.62, 16th overall. How about we move on to something a bit meatier? On the survey, we've got 10 movies that I would consider fully-fledged live-action or live-action adjacent remakes of animated Disney films. Along with those are three live-action movies that aren't remakes or pure adaptations per se, but definitely draw heavy inspiration from their original animated counterparts. We'll get to those ones soon. But first we'll tackle those core 10, starting with a Jungle Book remake in 1994, which I actually didn't include because they redid it again in 2016, Disney has steadily been redoing their animated catalog, but worse because for some reason it works. You've probably noticed this trend because ever since the second half of the 2010s, they've released a new one every goddamn day. These films, which we're discussing today, are 1996's 101 Dalmatians, 2010's Alice in Wonderland, 2015's Cinderella, 2016's The Jungle Book, 2017's Beauty and the Beast, 2019's Dumbo, Aladdin, The Lion King, and Lady and the Tramp, yes, really, four in a year, not even accounting for the remake-ish Maleficent Mistress of Evil that same year, and 2020's Mulan. If I were to put my finger on the pulse of the community, I'd say the one word I'd use to describe people's feelings toward these movies is dread. I know that doesn't speak for everyone, but it feels like the majority opinion. It's this sense of, we don't want these, and you would have been laughed out of the room for suggesting them as plausible options five years ago, but we know that with the direction the series is taking and how many of them keep getting pumped out, it frustratingly makes some kind of sense for them to be used. You know, that feeling. At least, that's how I feel, and it seems to be something echoed by a handful of people I speak to in my circle, but I do see it get some pushback here and there. And again, make no mistake, I don't really want these. I'm also not going to throw a fit if they're used, because I have faith they could make it at least somewhat interesting. I'll always prefer exploring the animated incarnations of these stories, especially new ones over repeats, but I can't sit here and say that it makes no sense at all. In this post cage 3 era, an era of alternate world lines and unrealities and people who look one way but are actually different people, I have very little difficulty seeing Nomura and the team tie these retellings into Cage 4. I imagine Sora waking up in Quadratum and venturing to worlds that feel familiar with people he seems to remember, but everything is just off and things play out slightly differently. I guess that last point is the biggest knock against these movies' likeliness, really, because how different can some of these feel? Once the novelty of the visuals wears off, you'd pretty much just be going through the motions that you already went through in KH2, like with Aladdin and The Lion King. I can't imagine they'd use this realistic coat of paint to tell a new story because the movies themselves didn't do that because they're remakes. Do they have the same appeal in video game form as they do, for whatever reason, in movie form? I'm not sure. That all being said, I still do find the prospect of visiting new versions of previously visited worlds more likely. I can't really place my finger on why, but I just feel like if the series is talking about unreality and alternate world lines, it sort of necessitates an already established world line for there to be an alternate version of it. From a thematic or storytelling perspective, I don't see what's to be gained by going to the live-action Jungle Book world when there's not a pre-established animated Jungle Book world to call back to and play off of. Plus, I think we'd all just rather see the original if we had the choice. I don't really know how Nomura feels about the live-action remake trend, and it really depends on his take, so... With all this in mind, I do have the live-action versions of previously visited worlds higher up on this list. In order of most to least likely for me, I'd say Alice in Wonderland, Aladdin, The Lion King, Beauty and the Beast, Mulan, Cinderella, The Jungle Book, Dumbo, Lady and the Tramp, 101 Dalmatians. Those bottom four have never had a cage world, though some have had representation in the series, but I don't know if it's enough to really make visiting their live-action counterparts super interesting. 
Even still, I have to put Jungle Book at the head of that pack just because of how much people seem to want it in whatever form it has to take, and it would probably be the best suited for a world out of those unvisited properties. It was, in fact, the highest rated live action remake for the audience on both scales at 3.87 for Want, 16th overall, and 3.55 for Prediction, 7th overall. I think that's, like, way high, but I am prepared to be proven wrong. I'll give it a 2 for Want and a 2.5 for Prediction myself. For the record, I'd give Dumbo, Leading the Tramp, and 101 Dalmatians all 1s for Want. I think I can spare a 2 for Prediction for Dumbo and Leading the Tramp, but not Dalmatians. It's just too old and kind of an outlier when it comes to these live action remakes. We'll talk about audience scores for those ones in a bit. Going back to my personal ordering of likeliness, I have those repeat worlds ranked higher, though still with some gaps between them. At the front lines for the remakes, I have the Tim Burton Alice in Wonderland, which I could perfectly envision as a KH4 world. The environments are big and interesting enough, and given that it's something of a pseudo-sequel or continuation of the 1951 film, there's enough new stuff to do and contend with. I'm not personally crazy about the movie, I think it's fine, but I have no doubt they could do a good job with it. Out of all the familiar worlds, I'd be most invested in seeing Sora react to this one, and I also think it'd be the most fun to play around in during gameplay. We've obviously seen a Tim Burton-led project be used in Cage before, so there's at least some precedence there. One thing that might be a hang-up though, and I really don't want to get in the weeds with this, is the Johnny Depp stuff. Pre- or post-trial, I don't know how interested Disney is in working with him, although things were already stirring well before and during the development of KH3, so there's really no telling. His character is pretty central to the remake, and it'd be hard to envision him being cut from it entirely, so it's hard to say. Without factoring that into the rankings, because I have no idea how to, I'll give Gritty Alice a want score of 3 and a prediction score of 5. This one was the second highest out of the remakes for the audience, who gave it a want of 3.81 for 19th place and a prediction score of 3.52 for 9th place. I'm realizing how I probably should have lumped this in with those pseudo-remakes, because plot-wise it's totally not a full-blown remake, it just shares the name with the original. Uh, oops. After that, I have Aladdin and the Lion King, which I'm definitely less intrigued by in terms of Sora's return to them, but would have to concede that they'd be more fun to play around in than the remaining ones and are probably the most popular. Also, yes, I know the Lion King 2019 isn't actually live action, like they didn't hire real lions and hyenas for this, but I have no idea where else we'd put it for the purposes of this survey. It is, in spirit, a live action remake, and boy do I hate it. And you know, the Pride Lands were already bland enough in Cage 2, I really would hate to see it be even further blandified in Cage 4. As for Aladdin, I haven't seen the remake, you can't make me watch every single one of these, but it seems like it sure does exist. I've listened to some of the songs on YouTube, and they don't slap quite as much as the original. I give both of them a want score of 1, but a prediction score of 4.5. Beauty and the Beast is next, in which I still think it would be at least a little interesting to see Sora interact with new versions of old friends, I just don't really want to be cooped up in a castle or small French town again. Want of one, prediction of three. Mulan, as a world Sora's only visited once, and Cinderella, a world he's never been to and barely interacted with residents from, are not as high on my personal likeliness list. Wants of one, and prediction of two for Mulan, and 2.5 for Cinderella. Cinderella does at least have the boost from Fairy Godmother's baffling rise to prominence over the past two games, so maybe there's some Something brewing as far as that's concerned. My biggest concern for these films isn't even it's weird that we're doing old worlds again but they look different, it's more so can we keep this from being boring and tell new stories when for the most part these stories are old with mostly the same characters and settings but higher budgets. Being honest, I prefer that we never find out but my heart and mind are open to the possibility. I'll tell you what though, it was really fun to see how the audience treated these movies, just a brutal, outright, declarative rejection. Outside of the previously covered Alice and perennial golden child The Jungle Book, the live-action remakes sunk to the absolute bottom of the want list. They occupy spots 32 to 41, with only the Country Bears and Mission to Mars interrupting the streak. They are in order from most to least wanted, with 101 Dalmatians in 32nd, 2.41, Dumbo in 34th, 2.23, Beauty and the Beast in 36th, 2.04, Aladdin in 37th, 2.03, Lady and the Tramp in 38th, 1.96, Cinderella in 39th, 1.95, The Lion King in 40th, 1.68, and Mulan in dead last, 1.6. Just an absolute massacre. My main parting message for this segment is just brace yourself for the possibility of one or two of these showing up. I don't want it, but I can see it and I'm mentally preparing for it. It seems like the audience shares this mindset for the most part, giving the remakes more credit in the prediction department. In order from lowest to highest this time, Lady and the Tramp in 33rd place at 1.82, followed by fellow dog movie 101 Dalmatians in 32nd at 1.83. Then it's Mulan in 29th place with 2.06, and Cinderella in 24th place at 2.2. 2. 
Next is Dumbo in 21st place at 2.35, The Lion King in 20th at 2.38, and Beauty and the Beast in 19th at 2.53. At the top of the list is Aladdin in 15th place with a score of 2.83. Sorry for the number soup there, wasn't really sure of a better way to do this. Moving on to those remake-ish movies, we have 2014's Maleficent, 2018's Christopher Robin, and 2021's Cruella. Right off the bat, I would give Cruella the lowest likelihood despite it being the newest movie. If they're going to introduce a Dalmatian's world into KH, I don't think it'll be by way of the villain origin story. I also have no idea how they'd make it into a workable world. I say it all the time, they could do anything, but I tend to prefer the ones that seem the easiest to realize. I'll give it a 2 for both scores. The audience gave it a want score of 2.62 for 31st place, just above that string of live-action remakes. For prediction, it earned a score of 2.61 for 17th place overall. Christopher Robin is kind of an interesting one. KH3 introduced a thread involving Sora losing his connection with Pooh during his brief visit to the wood, and there's certainly a parallel there with Christopher Robin. And I do think there's good potential for continuing that thread, playing on how much Sora has grown and changed and how increasingly serious and dire his adventures have gotten since he first visited the wood. Though it would be weird to return to some characters that have their original voice and some who don't for some reason. But if we're looking for a minigame world for this outing, I see a fairly easy path to using the 100 Acre Wood again, but with its more realistic look. And I would assume there'd be no need for the Christopher character, since Sora has effectively been a stand-in for him since the beginning. Hopefully they could come up with things to do in this much drearier and wide-open wood, because getting London involved seems like it would complicate things, though I suppose the world could always have two halves. I guess they could just make a minigame out of decreasing expenditures. I'll give it a 4 for want and a 5 for prediction. The audience was decently favorable to Christopher Robin, giving it a want score of 3.68, 20th overall, and a prediction score of 3.13, 12th overall. And rounding off these remake-esque films is Maleficent, and I suppose the sequel, Mistress of Evil. I do think this one has legs. While the film's garnered pretty mixed reception, I think as far as Cage 4 goes, it's one of the most well-suited things we've talked about so far. The Moors and the neighboring human kingdom is a visually interesting and big enough environment to match up to the standards of Cage 3's worlds. And that's a strong enough base, but the true intrigue and potential in this adaptation as a world lies in its title character. I can't help but root for anything that could potentially reinvigorate the KH Maleficent and give her some agency, or really just anything to do at all, and coming face to face with her alternate self seems like a great way to do that. Seeing Angelina Jolie Maleficent and Suzanne Blakesley Maleficent interact would be worth this world's inclusion alone. It could even kick off some sort of redemption arc for the KH Maleficent since the Jolie one is really more tragic than pure evil. I mean, even getting to see Sora meet a somewhat less malevolent Maleficent would be interesting, maybe even making her a party member. Or maybe the two Maleficents join forces and you've got P and Diaval in a henchman pissing contest. There's potential no matter which way you slice it, and I'd genuinely be interested in seeing it. So I'll give it a 6 for want and a 5.5 for prediction. It almost makes too much sense to me. The audience was a bit less enthusiastic, giving Maleficent a want score of 3.61 for 21st overall and a 3.36 for prediction at 11th overall. Alright, let's move on to something I know a lot of you are waiting for. It's time to talk about superheroes. 1991's The Rocketeer, a movie I first watched for this project, was pretty charming, though I would assume largely forgotten by most people buying Kingdom Hearts games. As much joy as I would take in seeing Sora hit Nazis, it's pretty much a joke that this one was included, and we'll get to some more of those later, believe me. Truthfully, a lot of these films were put on the survey not because I intended to say anything interesting about them or their chances, because frankly there's not a lot there, but because I just wanted to see where the audience's head was at and share that with you. Uh, forgive me. A 1 for prediction and a 2 for want, with the audience giving The Rocketeer a 3.33 for its want score, 23rd overall, and a 1.77 for its prediction score, 34th overall. Okay, sorry, now onto the superhero property that everyone wants to hear about. Sky High from 2005, a movie about teenagers who go to a superhero high school. I loved Sky High as a kid, and I watched it not too many years ago, and to be honest, I thought it still held up. It's nothing groundbreaking, but I don't know, I just like its vibe. Unfortunately, it's flanked from both angles by properties set in high schools and properties with superheroes that are both heavier hitters, plus I don't think anyone outside of a pretty specific age bracket even remembers that this movie was a thing. So for me, it's a 1 for prediction, but a fucking 8 for want, because why not? I want to see Sora deemed a sidekick while Donald and Goofy are both noted for heroic qualities. How fun would that be? The audience also seems to feel some nostalgia for Sky High, giving it a want score of 4.36, 12th overall, but a prediction score of 1.95, 30th overall. 
All right, all right, since so many people have asked, I guess I have to cover this impish little indie property that's so beloved by the underbelly of media connoisseurs, this little ragtag effort called the... Marvel Cinematic Universe? I know the MCU is something of a pressure point for KH fans, and I think you'll be relieved to know that I am a big, boring centrist on the matter with no passionate feelings one way or the other. I tend to give the idea of Marvel and KH the benefit of the doubt. I have seen these developers turn over 30 properties into fleshed out worlds, and even in the lowest moments, even in the grittiest, arendelliest, finny funniest moments, I've never thought, they completely blew it, or this does not belong in this game. I get the detractors, I get the idea of things being acquired not being as at home in these games as the things that were always made by Disney. I guess with me, I just really don't care. I've said before how the goalposts move all the time, how it's never been purely animated Disney movies and that the circle of inclusion widens basically every release, but to me it just makes more sense to say you don't want stuff like the MCU in the games because you don't like them, not because it doesn't pass some sort of world purity test. I've seen people claim that the series will jump the shark if they see MCU or Star Wars show up or even preemptively quit the series and it's like, Bro, do you remember gross, shitty 2005 PS2 Jack Sparrow? You survived that, like, don't be dramatic. We also jumped the shark a long, long time ago, but that's beside the point. I don't really care what Disney does or doesn't own or what they bought, I just want it to be fun and interesting to play around in and for it to have some thematic bearing on the story being told, if possible. So I'm open to it, it doesn't really ruin the magic for me, though I get why some people would rather not. Outside of just the general distaste for Marvel, folks who are against the idea of the MCU and KH often come back to the idea that there's simply too much to condense to make it work, but I don't know, I find that kind of lazy. It doesn't have to be literally the entire MCU or like the Infinity War saga represented in one KH4 world. I know I put just MCU as the option on the survey and not each specific movie or series because we'd be here even longer, but I think a couple of creative minds could cobble together an original story involving a handful of MCU characters. I mean, they do shit like that all the time with Marvel. Pretty much anything goes when you have multiverses and time travel at play, which, what do you know, Cage is in no short supply of either. If I absolutely had to pick one singular MCU movie to get the Cage treatment, it would just be the original 2012 Avengers since it's contained enough and squeezes in most of the big players. But like I said, they could remix that, throw in Thanos or different heroes or villains not from that specific movie, or just do something new entirely. In fact, I'd kind of prefer they did because I think just plain New York would be boring if we're also going to be spending time in Quadratum. Maybe something like Asgard would make for a better setting. Staying away from big modern cities and also stuff explicitly set in space is probably our best bet for reasons you can probably guess. And honestly, one of the biggest things holding Marvel back for me is the fact that we just did superhero shit in KH3, and I held that against The Incredibles too. In fact, said superhero shit was also originally a Marvel comic. Obviously, an MCU outing would be visually and I'm sure thematically distinct, but I just wonder if the general setup of a world inhabited by superhero characters and working with them as a team wouldn't feel stale to either Nomura or the players. But given just how fucking huge the MCU is, because let's face it, it's bigger than The Incredibles, I'd still have to give more points to it on the prediction side than I gave to the pars. I still don't think it's a certainty though, I think there's still enough stuff to go around to make a whole game of just live action properties without Marvel touching it. Plus, I truly have no idea how flexible the rights and celebrity likeness stuff is, again. So I'm giving the concept of an MCU-inspired world a 6 for both scores. The audience landed in generally the same spot, giving it a want score of 6.34, fourth overall, and a prediction score of 7.07, second overall. Okay, let's return to some less gargantuan contenders. In fact, let's return to Oz, and I guess we'll lump in Oz the Great and Powerful while we're at it. You might be surprised to find Wizard of Oz stuff in here, but Disney has in fact produced Oz stuff before, even though the original 1939 film was an MGM production. But 1985's Return to Oz and 2013's Oz the Great and Powerful, while reminiscent of the original film, are more directly based on the book series which is in the public domain. You could consider them an unofficial sequel and prequel, respectively. Return to Oz is most well known for being much darker when compared to the original, and I can confirm that the Wheelers are terrifying and I would be even more afraid of fighting them in the Unreal Engine. Oz the Great and Powerful is an origin story for the wizard himself and is obviously more recent and did better at the box office, though nowadays most fans of the Oz universe seem to prefer the 1985 one, but I'd have to think if they wanted to use an Oz movie they'd go with the newer and somewhat grander one. But it's all kind of a moot point to me because I think Oz and Wonderland both scratch a similar itch, and I have no doubt they'd go with Alice over Dorothy if faced with the choice. For that reason, I'll give them both a 1.5 for prediction. Return to Oz, I actually quite enjoy it as I watched it for the first time for this project, so I'll give it a 4.5 for want. Oz the Great and Powerful, I couldn't really care less about, so I don't know, a 2 for want. 
The audience was pretty middling on the Oz flicks, giving Return to Oz a want score of 3.31 for a 25th overall and a prediction score of 1.75 for a 36th overall. The Great and Powerful fared better with a want score of 3.52 for 22nd place and a prediction score of 2.2 for 25th place. Alright, let's get through a bunch of shit that has no chance and that I regret putting on the survey. To be honest, I did not plan this video out well. I overwhelmed myself for no reason and it's taking too long to make. I'm trying my best though. How, how are you doing? Are you, you alright? Let's see, uh, John Carter from 2012. Why the fuck did I put John Carter on the survey? Like, why'd I do this to myself? I'm surprised that Disney even bothered to fuck with another Edgar Rice Bros property, because if it did appear, they'd have to pretend it never happened in Cage 5. A 1 for both scores for me. I guess I'd rather go to this Mars than the Mission to Mars Mars, so there's that at least. The audience gave JC a want score of 2.66 for 30th place, and a prediction score of 1.63 for 39th place. Okay, let's see, uh, Flubber, 1997, there is no fucking way a world in Kingdom Hearts 4 is based on Flubber, and no unreality or a multiverse or world line or whatever the fuck does that happen. A Flubber summon, though, now we're talking. A 1 for prediction, a 2 for 1, Flubber is fun, I got nothing against Flubber. Audience said 3.85 for want, 17th overall, and 1.85 for prediction, 31st overall. Holes from 2003. What was I even thinking? Like seriously, Stanley Yelnat's party member? Boss fight against Mr. Sir? A heartless made out of... Holes? Shovel Keyblade? Fuck it, let's do it. Six for want, one for prediction. The audience gave Holes a want of 3.81, 18th overall, a prediction of 1.74, 37th overall. Inspector Gadget? Like, 1999 Matthew Broderick Inspector Gadget? People were way too high on this. But I guess it's still more likely than the last few movies we talked about. I watched it and hated it, but some days I wake up as a joyless parasite, so that could have been why. Go Go Gadget Keyblade. Penny as a princess of heart. I'm just throwing shit at the wall now. I'll give that two ones. The audience, bafflingly, gave Inspector Gadget a 3.99 for 14th place on the want side, and a 2.14 for 27th place on the prediction side. Let's see, I've got old shit if you want some old shit. Um, 1954's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, based on the Jules Verne novel. Honestly, I put this on because it did have a pretty big place in early Disney history, and it had a pretty big presence in its theme parks as well. I think my attention span was too short for it, like, I respect it more than I liked watching it, if that makes sense. But as a world with oceans and squid monsters and cannibals, we're pretty much already covered between pirates and Moana, and I don't know how excited people are getting over this in 2022. I'll be giving that a 1 for prediction and a 2 for want. The audience gave it a want score of 3.13 for 28th place and a prediction score of 1.75 for 35th place. How about some other old shit, like Pete's Dragon from 1977? I have to admit, when I put it on the survey, I had no idea they remade it in 2016, so that may have confused people, though I did note it as the 1977 version and used the poster from that release. But with that in mind, I'd think the 2016 remake is inherently more likely, though we're talking about a difference between, like, 1.5 and 2 for my own prediction rating. The environment isn't really anything outstanding, although both versions seemed charming enough. This is, again, probably something that works better with Elliot as a cameo or summon, though Figment is still my preferred dragon for that role. I feel like it's more of a fixture in Disney history and part of the public consciousness more than stuff like John Carter or Flubber, so it's got that going for it, I guess. I'll give it a 2 for both prediction and want. The audience gave Pete's Dragon a want score of 3.16 for 27th place and a prediction score of 2.12 for 28th place. Let's pivot to something a bit stylistically similar but a lot more beloved and iconic, 1964's Mary Poppins. For me, it's kind of insane that Mary Poppins hasn't even been referenced in KH yet, across 20 years and like 15 or so games. And granted, maybe a full world is tough to envision if you're just basing it off of 1910 London. Most of the magic comes from Mary Poppins the character and not really the environment, so maybe it doesn't lend itself super easily to a KH world. But I don't know, you could take some creative liberties and make a sort of Symphony of Sorcery-esque thing out of the pavement drawing segment, which is where all the animated stuff takes place. I guess you'd be taking, like, the 20-minute animated segment from this 90-minute movie and making just that the world setting, which maybe runs a bit counterintuitive to the whole live-action exercise, but it's the best way I could envision it working. It's really just so weird that we've seen Pirates and Tron show up twice now, but not even a Mary Poppins cameo yet. It just feels so baked into the Disney identity, and it's a property they obviously still have in mind, if only judging by much more recent films like 2013's Saving Mr. Banks and 2018's Mary Poppins Returns. 
I mean, there's more animated stuff they could pull from the sequel too if they wanted to flesh out a world a bit more. I think it's doable, it just depends on if Nomura is interested in pursuing it. I'd say it's got a decent shot if this game is, by some chance, entirely live action. I would think Mary Poppins is big enough to earn a world, even if only like a minigame one, which is kind of how I'd always envisioned it. So I guess I'd give a 6 for want and a 4 for prediction. The audience had similar feelings, giving Poppins a want score of 5.6 for 6th overall and a prediction score of 4.01, also 6th overall. We may as well finish up on the theme of hand-drawn animation mixing with live action and cover 1988's Who Framed Roger Rabbit. This is one I actually hear discussed now and then, and a lot of people seem to back out when they remember the cameos from non-Disney owners like the Looney Tunes characters, but hear me out, just cut them and replace them with generic tunes or like Epic Mickey Mean Street type of stuff. I knew playing Epic Mickey on my Twitch channel would pay off somehow. Or, hey, we live in a world with Sora and Smash Bros, maybe anything is possible. Okay, well probably not this, but damn would it be cool. Obviously I envision the world as taking place primarily in Toontown, and I think the world even has legs thematically. For the purpose of judging Cage Force candidates, I'm always going to be a bit higher on stories where characters cross over into another world or dimension unlike their own, and we'll have more of that later. I know Toontown is just a neighboring area and not like an alternate reality, but same general idea. And you know, Nomura said that just because the Xehanort saga is over, that doesn't mean Xehanort is gone forever, which is an obvious hint at his upcoming appearance as his 14th and final vessel, Judge Doom, portrayed by Christopher Lloyd himself, whom Sora immediately kills with his dip-themed keyblade. Sick of this fucking guy. Overall, while I have no trouble seeing this as a world, even if it were to mix in a regular but stylized LA area, I think if the game was to pull from standalone movies, they're going to trend newer unless they're truly giants like the aforementioned Mary Poppins. And this one is 34 years old at this point. It'd be cute, but it feels unlikely. I give it a 7.5 for want, but a 3 for prediction. The audience landed in a similar spot, giving Roger Rabbit a want of 7.2 for 2nd overall and a prediction score of 3.53 for 8th overall. Let's pivot back to nonsense, 2004's National Treasure, which, you know what, I fucking love unapologetically. It's a cheese fest, it's stupid, but it's fun. I would pay double price for Sora to unlock the case holding the Declaration of Independence for a Nick Cage party member. I want a flow motion spinner on the fucking Liberty Bell. I want to kill Mount Rushmore. I cannot conceive a more natural new seven heart than the cornerstone of Disney ladies Dr. Abigail Chase. I perfectly envision a beast-esque mini-boss fight against Ben's panicked father, John Voight, who may actually have to be a recast since he's already booked as Mr. Server the Holes World. One for prediction, 17 for want, triple that if I get to know what the fuck is on page 47. The audience failed to match my enthusiasm, try as they might. They gave National Treasure a 4.48 for want, 10th overall, and a 2.18 for prediction, 26th overall. Oh right, I forgot to talk about 1989's Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Honestly, I kinda dig it. Think Toy Box, but less cartoony and more stuff like Andy's Room or Ven's Castle of Dreams visit where you actually feel the sense of scale a bit more. I always think shrunken down shit is fun in video games, and while Cage 3 attempted to go all in with that via Toy Box, it was, as I referenced, mostly felt in Andy's Room and Street, but started to feel a bit wacky by the time you got to Galaxy Toys. Honey, I Shrunk the Kids would likely feel a bit more grounded throughout, even despite the, you know, big ant and scorpion stuff. I mean, it could basically be like a more realistic looking Bugs Life, and Disney seemed to give it some attention past its initial release, like I remember it had a show in Epcot up till 2010 and that playground area at Hollywood Studios till 2016. But I know some younger audience members and non-Americans were like, what the fuck is this movie when they saw it on the survey, and I'm kind of being generous to it with my entertaining it as a KH world. Physically, I have no problem imagining it, but practically, what do you even call the place, why do you go there, and how would it be tied into the overarching stuff, it's all kind of a question mark. So, a want of 5.5 and a prediction of 2 for me. The audience took my want score and shrunk it, giving Honey a score of 3.93, 15th overall, and a prediction score of 2.32, 22nd overall. How about some magic and whimsy and shit like that? Let's stop down at 1993's Hocus Pocus, which, believe it or not, I had not watched until starting this project. And you know what's weird? I had seen the characters and small clips from the movie over the years, and I had always just assumed the witches were the protagonists, so I was admittedly bummed out when I realized we probably wouldn't get a Bette Midler or SJP party member and instead be shackled with... California mid-90s, whatever this fucking kid's name was. It was a fun movie, though, and I want to see it in Cage 4 solely because the witches are brought to life by a virgin lighting a candle, and I would like Goofy to light the candle and see what happens so we can confirm or deconfirm the existence of Max Goof in the Cage canon. 
I'd also be keen on seeing how the witches power scale against fellow magic users like Fairy Gma or Merlin since they seem to just keep getting buffed with each game. Realistically though, I don't quite see it, though Hocus Pocus 2 is scheduled to come out this month. Please god tell me this video is out before that. It's probably more on Disney's mind than most of the stuff we've covered today, but I doubt it makes the cut. I'll give it a want of 5 and a prediction of 2. The audience gave Hocus Pocus a want score of 4.83, 8th overall, and a prediction score of 3.12, 13th overall. Switching over to another magic-based film, and yet another movie getting a sequel soon, it's 2007's Enchanted, with Disenchanted set to release in November of this year. And if this video isn't out by then, you have permission to kill me. Once again, I have a bit more favor for movies with some sort of crossing over into a new reality element, which would be reminiscent of KH4 setup as a whole, and this is something that Enchanted does. Only, but fittingly, about 13 minutes of the film is animated, with the rest of it taking place in regular New York. And at the end of the day, I have to imagine that they'd only use, at most, one New York-based world, and I have to wonder if Enchanted is the one they pick for it. I honestly have my trepidations about them using New York or any other big city at all, real or fictional, since I figure it could feel a bit redundant if Quadratum is to serve as our base of operations. And I also think setting the world inside the animated fairy tale kingdom would kind of rob it of its most interesting bits. The cartoon stuff is basically just Disney doing a self-parody, though I would love for Kingdom Hearts to give the same treatment to itself, but I'm not quite sure just how much meta roulette Nomura is willing to play. Still, it's not a terrible or completely unrealistic pick if you ask me, and I'd even consider Giselle as a dark horse for one of the new seven. Plus, you get to fight a big Susan Saran dragon, so that's a layup for the boss fight. I'll give Enchanted a 5.5 for want and a 4 for prediction. The audience gave it a 5.22 for want, 7th overall, and a 3.43 for prediction, 10th overall. Okay, let's talk minigame worlds. I know you're all waiting for this one. High School Musical, which originated as a made-for-TV movie in 2006, then another in 2007, and a theatrical third release in 2008. People have memed about a High School Musical world in KH since the first movie came out, and like with many of these films, the first time I've ever truly considered the possibility is for KH4. As I said up top, I think the only way this happens is some sort of KH2 Atlantica-esque musical minigame world. I don't exactly anticipate Sharpay being corrupted by Heartless and a subsequent boss fight with Troy and Gabriella by Sora's side. I could see Sora rolling up into East High and being like, what? School? Homework? Etc. And he gets roped into some save the day through song shit or whatever it is they do. Doesn't have to relate back to the overarching stuff at all, since Cage 2's music world didn't. Obviously I'd prefer it, but it can still be in there without any enemies or outside threat or whatever. Now, while I said that HSM is the likeliest it's ever been in the run-up to Cage 4, it's probably more true to say that it was at peak likeliness, but prior to Melody of Memory. My gut says that despite the relative popularity of High School Musical, I don't really think we'll dedicate a world, minigame or not, to some sort of rhythm-based gameplay style after we had a whole game focused on just that. Also, and I know I'm going to upset like most of my patrons when I say this, but this shit is the bane of my existence. I was forced to sing these songs in 4th grade chorus class, and so I have an unhealthy resentment for what I consider the monolith of peak Disney Channel preteen cornball schlock. That's just me, no yum yucking, I still love you. We're all in this together, after all. That'll be a 1 for want and a 2.5 for prediction for me. The audience was unsurprisingly kinder, giving HSM a want of 4.29 for 13th overall and a prediction score of 2.59 for 18th overall. Speaking of music though, it's time to play the music, and it's also time to light the lights, but is it time to meet the Muppets in a Cage 4 world? Once again, I think now is the best chance it's ever had, also best suited for some kind of minigame world. I also think, unlike HSM, a Muppets world could more easily come up with more than just music-related minigames. And there's like, more than 60 years of stuff to work with, so it can be any setting, though I think just making it a sort of backstage thing at Muppet Studios would probably work best. I kind of envision it as a show that airs in Quadratum that Sora, like, accesses through a TV or something, and then helps the various Muppets get stuff ready for some big production. Ideally, he'd be able to come back and unlock more games, unlike the short burst of 100 Acre Wood stuff in KH3. Or it could even have, like, characters that you can return collectibles to from outside the world, like finding Fozzie's lost joke cards or experiments for Honeydew, stuff like that. In the survey, I used the 2011 movie as the image because I figured it could also go the route of using that plot as the basis for the world, having Sora reunite the gang and raising money to save the studio. And, you know, ultimately failing, but realizing that friendship is more important or something. But then actually getting the studio back due to a change of heart and nothing to do with blunt Keyblade trauma. And again, I will pay double price to see Sora in Muppet form. 
It's something I have no problem seeing as a world, and if we're leaning live action, I think it'd be up there for top spot for a minigame or non-combat world, probably in closest contest with Christopher Robin. So I'll give it a 6 for want and a 5 for prediction. The audience gave the Muppets a want score of 6.32 for 5th place overall, and a prediction score of 4.03, also 5th place. So, Avatar sure was a movie that came out in 2009. I feel like I've been hearing about two to four Avatar sequels since, like, before 2009. It feels like a constant that's always been there for me. There's this sort of running joke about how Avatar made a butt-ton of money but left, like, no footprint in the cultural consciousness, and that may be true, but all that matters now is that Disney owns it and it seems like it's fair game for KH. And it's not like it's just sitting there on their shelf, they've got a whole theme park section for it now, and apparently that second movie is actually going to be coming out before Cage 4 does, so maybe it's going to be, like, relevant again, just in time for Pandora to be a world. And to be honest, it's hard to say that it wouldn't work more naturally in KH than literally anything else we've talked about so far today. And I'm not a huge Avatar guy, I don't really know who is. I hear Avatar, I think Aang. But like, big lush planet with sci-fi adventure shit happening, blue cat people party members, whatever their names were, it's wide and open enough you can make sense out of fighting Heartless there. It seems pretty easy to make a reality. And I mean, it'd probably be fun. It's a pretty world, there's like, flying shit and big mountains and like a tree. And now I'm spent on things to say about Avatar. I guess the only question is if Nomura's willing or able to use stuff acquired from Fox, but if there's no legal red tape to go through, then I don't really see why not. Uh, it'll be a 5 for want and a 6 for prediction for me. The audience gave Avatar a 4.43 want score for 11th overall and a 4.93 prediction score for 3rd overall. Alright, oh, Disney owns Indiana Jones. There's so much other shit flying around, it's kind of easy to forget about the comparatively more grounded properties. And you might consider Indiana Jones to be sort of out of the limelight, albeit generally beloved, but it does in fact have a fifth movie releasing in 2023, so it'll be back at the forefront again. I would think an Indiana Jones world would probably stick to the original 80s trilogy though, or maybe something entirely invented for KH. Although I kind of struggle to see something made out of, like, Raiders of the Lost Ark, considering how it's not really contained to a central location and is more comprised of set pieces in different countries. Of course, it wouldn't be impossible to be able to fast travel between several locations that you'd unlock throughout your first visit to the world, not unlike Port Royal or the Caribbean, which I think an indie world would feel most similar to. At that point, though, I'm not even sure what you'd call the world, since you're basically just jumping from, like, Peru to the Mediterranean to Egypt and so on. And we'll talk more about another potential world with intimidating scope in a bit, but aside from the aforementioned Pirates worlds, there isn't a ton of precedent for worlds in KH based on movies that take place across such a wide variety of locations. And even those Pirates worlds were confined to, well, the Caribbean. I guess I'm looking for these worlds to fulfill some sort of contradictory criteria of open but contained. Like I said, if they could conjure up some way to keep everything in one centralized or at least loosely connected area, I think I'd warm up to the idea a bit more. Not to say I'm cold on the idea, Indy himself would obviously make for a natural party member, and there's plenty of room for fun sequences like the boulder chase. And once again, punching Nazis. I guess I'm just not entirely sold on it or able to envision it as easily as some other stuff. I also have to wonder if they'd pick, you know, two Lucasfilms things for this go-around. I'll give it a 5 for want and a 4 for prediction. The audience gave Indy a want score of 6.63 for 3rd place and a prediction score of 4.83 for 4th place. Alright, we've arrived at our final destination, a galaxy far, far away. I figured we may as well save it for the end since it's the biggest talking point and you all probably could have guessed that it was topping the audience charts on both scales anyway. So let's not bury the lead, a want score of 7.6 and a prediction score of 8.69 for first on both scales. It was genuinely impossible to avoid talking about or referencing Star Wars up to the very last part of the script before actually focusing on the topic. Longtime viewers may know that I am admittedly not a Star Wars guy. Not that I dislike it, it just never really pulled me in. I've seen episode 4 and, get ready, episode 8, and that's it. And my gut reaction to the idea as someone who's seen two movies and thought they were pretty good, and as someone who's knee-deep in Kingdom Hearts bullshit is... Yeah, why not? It seems like a slam dunk if you ask me. Harkening back to the MCU discussion, I get why the idea might rub people the wrong way. Most of us grew up with these things not being Disney, and we understand Kingdom Hearts as intrinsically Disney. But again, I just don't really get hung up on the property ownership stuff. I don't really get the argument that it's too thematically or tonally dissonant from the games. It's got light versus dark shit, it's in space, it has the ending of worlds, animal companions, princesses, special weapons, and masters who wield them, like, it's the same fucking thing. 
And then in my script, I said LMAO. I know it scored the highest on the survey, but it still feels to me like I see a predominantly negative reaction towards the idea, and I just don't get it. Maybe it's from Star Wars fans who are worried it can't be done justice or that it would pick the wrong movies or eras to focus on, and it does raise the question of whether it would center more on the original trilogy or the Disney-produced new trilogy. I think you can safely sit the prequels out. And obviously, we've avoided talking about Foot Forest Gate because, to be honest, I still don't know what to make of it. I mean, that shit is literally an ATST foot. And yet, this world didn't score like a 9.8 on the prediction scale from the audience. And I just feel like, am I missing something? Like, there's a long history of KH trailers or other media coming out and people hyper fixating on one thing, convincing themselves and others that this means something is confirmed 100% fact, and then asterisk fart noise asterisk. But like, that's a fucking robot foot there. Either this is another installment in that long line of fart noises, or this is like the first time it's the real deal. And I tend to lean towards the latter. In my mind, the only way there isn't a Star Wars world is if this is just like an easter egg, like a forest on the outskirts of Quadratum littered with abandoned relics and one of them just happens to be a Star Wars robot foot. But it would seem like a cruel joke to play on people, would it not? Not that the series is a stranger to cruel jokes or switcheroos, but it's also weird to just show what is potentially Endor in the middle of a Quadratum-focused trailer to soft-confirm Star Wars via a few seconds of an inanimate object on the edge of the screen in an era where people are going to notice it within minutes of it being public and then proceeding to make several thousands of dollars writing shitty articles or making shitty videos about it. Like, seems weird to do it that way, but what else could it even be? Regardless, I'm fully open to it, and honestly, I'd be excited to see such a monumental property be given the KH treatment. I know there are trepidations about squeezing a trilogy or even just one movie into a KH world, but to, again, draw from my discussions about Indiana Jones, the Pirates worlds, and a hypothetical treasure planet from the first episode, I think these fears are easily mitigated with a fast travel or world map type of thing within the Star Wars world. And it'll make sense if KH4 isn't contextualized through space travel, so I think it'd be the best spot for Star Wars to not feel like it's clashing with an already established lore about how space works. Or, 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 the ATST foot is like a gummy block and there is still space and all the Star Wars stuff is confined to like in between worlds gummy stuff, which is a popular suggestion I've heard over the years. But I don't know, it seems like the writing is on the wall. Mickey and Yoda are gonna fight. I'm giving it a 6.5 for want and a 9.5 for prediction, saving that 0.5 in case it's not a fully fledged world after all. Okay, we did it. As I mentioned partway through this video, I felt like I may have bit off more than I can chew with this one, and I do apologize for how long it took to get this one out. I sort of grappled with the idea of how to even structure this one, which movies I needed to actually sit all the way through, and which ones I could just like skim around and read about to get the gist of it and stuff like that. It all just sort of stressed me out, and I ended up taking a break to make that video about the KH1 novel, and it was just like plain and simple procrastination. I really appreciate your patience as I work through it, unless you weren't patient and bugged me about it, in which case fuck you, but that was only like three people or so, so fuck you three. The uploads aren't constant because I want to take my time to do it the right way, or at least the way I think is right, because to me it literally isn't worth doing otherwise. That all being said, I figure the World Watch series will continue, but perhaps not immediately. I don't fully know what the next logical follow-up is. I had always intended an episode on Returning Worlds, which is the survey I'll provide you with now, though I'm not sure if it'll be necessarily part four. I've had a lot of requests to talk about Disney Channel TV shows or all of the acquired Fox properties, and I feel very iffy on the subject because, truthfully, I don't find a lot of stuff we haven't already covered to be incredibly likely or worth a lot of discussion. I wouldn't mind collecting and presenting the data, but I wouldn't have a ton to say about a lot of it outside of the number soup. So here's me asking for honest feedback about if you'd like to see more parts of this and how I should go about presenting it. I won't be offended if you're satisfied with just these three parts. But as I said, Returning World Survey is in the pinned comment, which would also probably be a shorter video since I don't think there's a ton of likely returnee candidates either. In the case that I do pivot to another topic for Part 4, I'll update that comment with a different survey, and you can also just keep up with me on Twitter or my Discord for any news on that. While I'm at it, if you really enjoyed and are interested in supporting the channel, Patreon.com slash RegularPat is the best way to do that. YouTube does not pay the bills, and I cannot do this without the generosity of my patrons. Anyway, that's all from me. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time in whatever form that happens to be. Take it easy.